Okay, so the status of private property rights in Rousseau's work remains deeply contested in the scholarship around his ideas. Does Rousseau think of private property rights in a fundamentally bourgeois way, that is as natural in the sense of being in some important way constitutive of our freedom, such that without these rights, we would be missing a crucial component of what allows us to conceive of ourselves as morally autonomous, responsible beings? Or does Rousseau think of private property rights in the end as purely conventional and artificial, as contingent artifacts of historical development, as arrangements that might have been otherwise and could still be otherwise, and thus as ultimately unnecessary for freedom and even a potential hindrance to freedom? In other words, is Rousseau closer to someone like Locke or is he closer to someone like Marx? Well, reading the second discourse, it can seem really clear that Rousseau was not a Lockean. <laughs> there, he famously depicts the institution of property as humanity's fall from natural happiness and goodness, the decisive end of the state of nature, and the first chains of the civil condition. Yet, in his discourse on political economy, Rousseau describes property as, quote, the most sacred of all the rights of citizens, and more important in certain respects than freedom itself. And he goes still further in the social contract where private property is seemingly the precondition for popular sovereignty. If property is a political, pre-political natural right, then why does Rousseau depict its establishment as a break with nature? But if property is not a natural right, then why does proper, or Rousseau call it sacred? So most scholars agree overwhelmingly that Rousseau does not think of property as a natural right in Locke's sense. But there is not really any consensus beyond that on what uh, Rousseau's concern with property actually is. There have been uh, many proposed solutions to this problem, so I won't list them all, but I'll lay out three general possibilities. So the first possibility is that Rousseau um, retains the part of Locke's account that sees property ownership as an important co component of autonomy, even as he rejects um, the particular components of that account that could justify endless additional accumulation by the rich against the poor. So this is uh, Ryan uh, Hanley's solution, for instance. Um, and so he argues that uh, Rousseau makes a distinction between the right to possess property, which is something closer to a natural right, and the right to acquire more property, which is not. A second possibility is that Rousseau rejects the idea that property is ever a natural right, um, except in, in perhaps the most limited sense that we have a natural right to what we need for survival. Um, a kind of survival right could justify unequal taking from the commons um, to the extent of need, but not exclusive and perpetual appropriation of land or resources for additional profit um, behind, beyond that minimum. In this line of interpretation, not only is private property not necessary for autonomy, but conversely, it's the act of alienating uh, one's possessions to the community that is the true path to autonomy. So as Nenerol, um, Keohain, emphasizes this kind of alienation or surrender of property may be a primarily symbolic act in the sense that resources can still be privately held and managed as long as people still understand that the distribution of property exists for the sake of the common good. So this reading of Rousseau maybe aligns him um, somewhat with Aristotle's suggestion in the politics that, uh, quote, it is better for property to be private and its use communal, end quote. So the point would be that freedom does not lie in one's degree of personal control over possessions, but rather in the reciprocal willingness of everyone to contribute talents and goods to, to the service of the community. And this reading would make sense of why, according to Rousseau, the sovereign cannot um, take uh, one person's possessions, but can take everyone's possessions, um, because it's a violation of reciprocity that harms autonomy, not the violation of private property rights per se. A third possibility is that Rousseau's interest in the question of property rights is primarily historical. And so while he may not see any necessary connection between private property and freedom when considering human nature abstractly, he may nonetheless take seriously their contingent historical relationship. So Chris Pearson, for instance, defends something like this view, um, writing that for Rousseau, quote, private property may bring a fateful, perhaps undesirable, and but certainly re irreversible change. Um, but given that there's no going back, it may be that the best cure for the vices that this brings in its train is actually a further dose of private property, end quote. So private property is a sort of unfortunate necessity and inevitability, um, although it can be managed in better or worse ways. 
a different version of this kind of account portrays um, Rousseau as a theorist and not just as a critic of what we today call um, commercial society, a term that he admittedly does not use himself. Um, in other words, we have to read his amb ambiguity on property in terms of his attention to the dynamics of, of political economy and the fiscal state that was emerging in his time. So for instance, Isman Hunt sees uh, uh, Rousseau as hostile primarily to uneven growth, not all ec academic um, economic development whatsoever. And in this kind of reading, private property for Rousseau is not so much the unfortunate, though irreversible, effective human civilization writ large, Instead, it's a contradictory requirement of a particular um, stage of European economic development. So private property did not arise necessarily, but contingently, um, and so is not justified by hu human nature as such. Um, but looking back from the perspective of the present, it was a necessity for you know, 18th century Europeans to become the kind of beings that they were. And um, this is the equivocal historical situation that Rousseau is wrestling with. So if Rousseau is apparently contradictory on property, it's perhaps because he sees this particular societal form, European commercial society, as contradictory in itself. Okay, my own approach to Rousseau on property is most in line with this last um, kind of interpretation. But my own specific uh, contribution to this debate is um, that I don't simply want to reconstruct a theory of property from the mess of Rousseau's uh, apparently conflicting views. Instead, I want to suggest a strategy of reading Rousseau through what I refer to as his images of nature. Images are not in themselves concepts, um, but they participate in shaping the meaning of concepts, and they help us to see concepts in particular lived experiences. For instance, as a concept, um, the term patriarchy conveys a system in which men hold power over women. But images of patriarchy help connect this abstract concept to concrete experiences, like being asked in a job interview if one plans to have children, or walking down the street and being told to smile. So similarly, I argue that Rousseau is maybe, maybe not the best uh, theorist for patriarchy, but his concept of nature and how he thinks about private property rights within this concept is expressed in his work largely through the many images of nature that he offers. So what's key for, key for me here is that I think that if we want to understand Rousseau on nature and property, we can't just um, confine ourselves to the image of nature that comes um, in the state of nature. Although that, of course, is important. Taken on its own, that quasi-historical narrative might suggest that nature is something that once existed and does not exist anymore, the other of society. Read this way, property absent from the state of nature cannot be a right authorized by nature. But Rousseau offered multiple images of nature across his writings, and many of these images depict nature within society, not prior to it. So when we look at all these images together, we can see that Rousseau doesn't conceive of nature as a lost origin, a utopia, or I think even a theodicy. Instead, it's a form of relation and a standard of critique, um, one that might be lost and rebuilt over and over again. And this way of making sense of nature in Rousseau turns out to help us with this vexed question of property. <clears throat> so by analyzing um, a series of images of nature, I'm not gonna do all, all, of, all of them, there's so many, but um, I'm gonna go through a few. I argue that private property is decisively not a natural right for Rousseau. However, it is a right that must be made natural if it, along with commercial society more generally, is to survive. Okay, so in my remaining time, I'm going to go through three images of nature and then um, conclude by saying what I think these images show us about Rousseau's um, complex views on property. So what these three images that I'm going to go through have in common is that they portray nature not as a static external object or a lost essential origin, but in terms of a, a dynamic relationship characterized by um, a, a kind of balance or harmony. So when the relationship in question is unbalanced, set in a state of conflict, then the relationship is unnatural. And conversely, when it is balanced, the relationship is natural. Um, but in each image that I'll work through, there's a different sort of relationship at stake. So the first relationship is between, I think, human and non-human. And here I don't uh, just mean human versus animal. What I, what I instead mean is the tension between what we perceive to have been made or shaped by human labor and artifice 
versus what we perceive to have been untouched by human um, uh, intervention and activity. So Rousseau introduces this kind of image of nature in um, his novel, Julie, when the titular character is showing her garden to her former lover, um, Saint Pro. So he says, quote, I thought I was looking at the wildest, most solitary place in nature. And he tells Julie that he sees no human labor here. Julie then reveals that the natural appearance of the garden is actually the result of careful cultivation. It is true, she says, that nature did it all, but under my direction. There is nothing here that I have not designed. So here, Julie gives credit to nature, not as the other of artifice, but instead as that which cooperates with and is developed by artifice. St. Pro believes he is looking at pure, fully non-human nature. <laughs> He's mistaken. And not only is he mistaken, but we might also ask whether such an experience is even possible. Um, once the human looks on apparently pure nature and names it, it becomes at that moment already mixed up with human feelings, desires, and needs. In a sense, then, it is impossible to perceive the purely non-human because we put something of ourselves into it in the act of perception. But that does not mean that the non-human does not exist also as part of the experience. What makes St. Po call Julie's garden natural is not just her skill at artifice, but also her respect for what is not hers, what she shapes and encourages, but did not make on her own. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the image of Julie's garden can be contrasted to Rousseau's description in the second discourse of the statue of Glaucus which he describes as so disfigured by time, seas and tempests, <coughs> that it looked more like a wild beast than a god. Rousseau uses this image to describe the human soul as he perceives it in the present. And it's almost the exact reverse of what he sees in Julie, or what's seen in Julie's garden. <laughs> in the garden, Julie takes what is non-human and cooperates with it um, through her labor to produce the, thank you so much, to produce the harmony that St. Um, uh, uh, Poe experiences as nature. In contrast, the stat statue of Glaucus, which one imagines must have uh, once been made by human hands, is left neglected, exposed to the elements over time, and thus becomes so disfigured that nothing natural can be seen in it anymore at all. And instead it appears monstrous, unnatural in the extreme. Rousseau's suggestion here, I think, is that the perception of nature is a result of a harmony between what humans make and what they do not and cannot make. And human nature itself must contain both elements. And when presented in a balanced state, uh, in a cooperative state, Rousseau refers to it as good. But when human nature is presented in an unbalanced state, which is what he thinks the natural law tradition basically does, it appears corrupted and disfigured. This is a point he emphasizes in the second discourse when he describes what the human soul might look like if it were not so neglected, a being, quote, of celestial, celestial and majestic simplicity with which it had been endowed by its author. And he contrasts this to what it actually seems like to him to have become. That is, quote, a disturbing contest of passions that believes it reasons. <laughs> so that's the first image the relationship between human and non-human. The second image is closely connected to the first and um, it's best described, I think, as the relationship between self and world. I believe this can be found in what interpreters such as Chris Kelly and uh, John Scott have referred to as the pure state of nature, which is presented in the first part of the second discourse. Where so the pure state of nature contrasted um, uh, contrasts directly with the state of nature theories of his predecessors like Hobbes and Locke it portrays a very different relationship between self and world than those accounts do. In Hobbes picture, for instance, the self in question is full of voracious desires, in part made by this tremendous epistemic power to name things as we see fit. And the world is one of scarcity. In Locke's account, the self is a reasoning moral adult whose speech is regulated by being in linguistic community with others, but the world is not just full of scarcity, but also full of waste. 
it seems to be simultaneously not productive enough to meet human needs and also prone to spoilage by producing too much at the wrong time. So Locke's world needs human cultivation to be productive in the right way. And cultivation requires private partition, um, a particular vision of property. In both the Hobbesian and Lockean states of nature, the relationship between self and world is one of immediate conflict. <clears throat> and to resolve this conflict, we need the civil state. In Rousseau's pure state of nature, by contrast, the self has only purely physical needs, possessing neither speech nor reason, and the world is one of plenty. It, as he says, quote, offers storage and shelter to the animals of every species. Because there is no necessary conflict between self and world, there is no necessity for the civil state to come into being. Even the special uh, capacity of perfectibility that Rousseau claims is part of this pure state of, of human nature, only explains how humans could have become social beings, but not why. All that perfectibility does, after all, is allow humans to imitate the behaviors of other animals or natural events like lightning, striking, making fire. And through this imitation, humans can acquire skills, habits, and eventually tools that they did not originally possess by instinct. <clears throat> so perfectibility allows us to change our nature, but not along any preset path that leads necessarily or directly to society. And for Rousseau, sociability didn't arise from some internal necessity in the self. Instead, as we find out in part two of the second discourse, it arose from accidental cont contingent changes in the interaction between self and world. <coughs> so humans became social by way of accident, essentially. The third image of nature concerns social relations, and it appears in the intermediate stage between the loss of the pure state of nature and the invention of private property that leads to the creation of the state. Rousseau describes it as something like small scale village or tribal life, a just mean between the indolence of the primitive state and the petulant activity of our egoism, um, which he says must have been the most stable um, era. Um, Judith Sklar refers to this as the golden age, um, which she, she claims, and I, I agree, um, is a condition which Rousseau does not believe ever existed. It is not a historical narrative that describes the past, but rather a critical and normative standard that lives imaginatively in an aspirational future. Now, what is narratively interesting for the purposes of my inquiry here into the status of property rights is that Rousseau's depiction of the golden age is sandwiched in between two highly critical accounts of the invention of property. The first account is that famous passage um, that opens the second part of the second discourse. The first man who having enclosed a piece of ground to whom it occurred to say this is mine and found people sufficiently simple to believe him was the true founder of civil society. How many crimes, wars, murders, how many miseries and horrors mankind would have been spared by him who, pulling up the stakes or filling in the ditch, had cried out to his own kind, beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits are everyone and the earth's no one's. Then, of course, Rousseau walks back this dramatic depiction in which the invention of um, property seems to occur in one fatal moment of appropriation that's somewhere between theft and trickery, <clears throat> and instead um, gives a second account um, by describing the development of property rights in a more gradual and ambiguous sort of way. Now, in this in the other state of nature accounts from um, previous natural law theorists, this is where the problem of social relations are typically described that leads to the need of, for instance, a common judge, law, and the state. But in Rousseau's account, there is no problem in the social relations of the golden age. Even though social life does exist, a limited division of labor exists, and even a kind of incipient um, property uh, division that seems to exist. But this kind of um, social production, I think, that he describes existing in, the, in this golden age could still be consistent with nature since property claims would be um, time limited and function dependent. So if a family, for instance, engaged in agricultural production stopped providing food for the community, the community would no longer have um, a reason to continue recognizing their position, possession of the land. So what makes the relationship as natural is that there's a harmony between self-interest and collective good. The individual drive for preference produces inequality in status and resource distribution, but has not become um, yet prejudicial to the common good because unequal distribution um, is tied to social contribution. Those who do more to ensure the survival of the community receive more resources and influence. <laughs> and Rousseau writes, the use of iron and the consumption of commodities always exactly balanced each other. 
So there was no excess hoarding of money as social power that could be used to create social domination. Rousseau then describes what made these social relations unnatural as a um, kind of imaginative confusion in which possessions authorized by the community were transformed into pro property held against the community, introducing, he says, a new kind of right, that is to say, the right of property, which is different from the right deducible from the law of nature. It is only at this point that the problem appears that leads to the state, and it turns out to be a quasi-imaginary problem. That is, position, possession is dis distributed, but only some people, those who hold it, see it as property. Those who don't have it see it as theft, which is enforced only by the right of the strongest. And then Rousseau goes on to describe how this conflict was resolved in favor of the rich against the poor through um, the invention of rule of law, essentially. So to sum up what I think these three images of nature have shown us so far, it is that nature for Rousseau always describes a relationship characterized by a balance or harmony between its component parts. When we perceive nature, it is because of a harmony between what is um, perceived as made by human and not by made by human within this perception. When we reflect on what is natural in human nature, it is characterized by a harmony between the self and the external world. And sociability, which Rousseau depicts as a contingent artificial transformation of human nature, um, was not um, that was not at all necessary, either purely from the perspective of self or world, but only retrospectively through the accidental interaction between the two. Um, that's a result of the breaking apart of this harmony, which then gives rise potentially, but not in historical act actuality, to this third image of nature, the kind of social relation in which individual interest is matched to si social contribution, such that any inequality in resource distribution and social power is authorized by the community as a whole because it serves the common good. So within commercial society, all three relations of nature tend to be in a state of conflict, unbalanced, such that previous natural law theorists failed to see, or at least depict in their accounts of the state of nature, um, what is human and what is non-human and vice versa, and therefore end up naturalizing commercial social relations. And by naturalizing here, I mean making seem as necessary, original, inevitable, um, not good or beautiful, which is what I think Rousseau means when he, he says what it means to see nature truly. Meanwhile, commercial re uh, social relations themselves are characterized by at least two kinds of imbalance, one internal in which one's needs and desires are greater than our ability to fulfill them, which as um, Frederick Neuheiser, among many others, have explored, activates the harmful aspects of uh, perfectibility. Um, that, for, um, for instance, make the poor prefer to buy luxuries over necessities to avoid the shame of visible poverty and the rich to be so dependent on their um, sense of self-worth and how they're seen and valued by others that in effect they become the slaves of those they claim to be master over. The other imbalance is between individual interest and collective good in which private property becomes a right detached um, from, um, uh, from actual social contribution effectively being protected by the community without being authorized by it. <laughs> so if, as I've been trying to persuade you, this is the critique Rousseau is getting at through his images of nature, then how can he claim in texts like the discourse in political economy and the social contract that property is a sacred right, more important in certain respects than freedom itself? Is he naturalizing after all? Or is he representing a perspective from within commercial society, which he does not think is is necessarily true of social or political life per se, but it is contingently true from within the value structure and the mode of production of the particular mode of society that you know, he lived in and his audience lived in. This might make sense of why at the beginning of the social contract, he claims not to know how it happened that man, although born free, lives in change which seems to be just the sort of account that the second discourse provides. Right? So perhaps this is him driving a wedge between the project of denaturalization he pursues in the second discourse in response to and in conversation with natural law theorists and the more normative constructive project of the social contract. But perhaps instead, and um, this is what I'd like to suggest is that the denaturalization project is still very much alive in Rousseau's discussion of properties and his political writings. Because in the process of denaturalizing previous states of nature, he has also defined a set of relations which would need to be realized in order for property rights to be made natural. And the difference here between 
naturalizing private property and calling for them to be made naturalized think is that in the former, they're being presented as necessary, inevitable, a part of human nature or civilization as such, whereas in the latter Rousseauian approach, they're presented as uh, contingent, historically specific, likely to be replaced in the future, but also not merely uh, dismissible, purely um, imaginary because of the real function they play and might play better in the form of society that exists. So then for Rousseau, the project of making um, property rights natural would be analyzing the relationship produced by property regimes and evaluating them according to whether they um, promote or stand in balance and harmony between the component parts or not. When property rights do help foster or um, uh, this kind of relationship, they are authorized by nature. When they don't, um, then they're not. So what if pro private property rights are not authorized by nature? And I'll just conclude by ruminating on this question. Um, and there are reasons I think, particularly um, when one works through Rousseau's fraught writings on the subject of taxation, to think that he possibly thought that they simply could not be, at least not in large commercial states. Well, then one possibility is that the idea of making property rights natural stands as a normative and critical standard that admittedly might fairly easily slip into naturalization in which case Rousseau ends up closer to Locke. But on the other hand, there is the possibility that Rousseau, as he repeatedly said, saw revolution on the horizon across Europe, uh, in which the current form of society, um, as he critiqued it, would not survive much longer. And whether what would come next was better or worse, um, he ultimately could not say, in which case I think Rousseau would be closer to Marx, while still remaining in important respects bourgeois in his thinking. And maybe it is important to maintain that ambiguity in order to hold on to this critical perspective on nature that he offers, which simultaneously allows for the critique of property rights um, and the resources for being able to reimagine them in historical time rather than necessarily rejecting them entirely. And given that the uh, Lockean understanding of natural property rights has tended to consciously or otherwise dominate the past and present of American discourse, um, while Rousseau has often been associated with utopian or revolutionary or totalitarian proposals, I think recovering his unique perspective on, on the nature of property rights is worth considering as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thanks. Um... Wow, you all really know some Rousseau. Like this is impressive. Um, I was about to just completely fall into the void, but thank you so much. Your presentation was so clarifying to me. I felt like lots of things came together. I mean, obviously through showing lots of ambiguities. Um, but and I know not at all Rousseau readers agree about that the this the the contingent line that you're developing, but I really like it. Um, I thought it was convincing and um, convincing in a way that made me think just sort of about the history of state of nature and the social contract, but also Rousseau's own thinking about it in his time. I guess I'm not totally sure. I hope a question comes out of this. And maybe the question is just like, what do you think about this? What I'm going to say, which is uh, if, if I have, if I get your story right here, there's sort of Rousseau's version is like in history and he has no sense of when this may have happened or whatever, but there were accidents that have led to the emergence of something like property. Maybe he doesn't go on to say, but we might also add some of the features that I was looking at a bit deeper in history of individualism, of patriarchy, of, uh, of, of sovereignty, that these ideas emerged at some point, but he would say, well, maybe it was just, we don't know why, we don't know how, we don't know when, but at some point they emerged, it wasn't necessary that they did. But once they did, here we are, Rousseau talking about the nature of of things and then his own kind of ambiguous, his relationship would have to be ambiguous to those historical things. One, because he doesn't know enough about history to know what actually happened. And two, because he's already in a situation that his thought is so deeply constructed that he finds himself enmeshed in assumptions about the fundamental structure of individualism, about the nature of, of property and patriarchy, and like is trying not to naturalize them. I mean, anyways, in any case, I guess my my question, or what do you think about this? Because I guess part of the research that I had done about the history of this, maybe in one way you could say investigating Rousseau's speculations, was there indeed an accident? When did it happen? We don't know these things for sure, but archeologically we have some hunches. And I think some of those do go back to the beginnings of Indo-European cultures. And one piece of evidence would be 
this kind of inquiry about social contracts and states of nature is a very Indo-European conversation. The whole premise of all the questions are fundamentally only for some cultures. Others just do not pose the question in this way. They would never be like, what is the state of nature? This is just like not the same framework. This is not even in the remote ontological framework. But like Rousseau finds himself in that. So I guess my addition would be to say that like the way that Rousseau is even telling the story might be a way that uh, like a distinctly Indo-European way. So when he says um, like, uh, and I agree, he's not Locke, but he is somewhere maybe between Locke and Rousseau. That was like, or Locke and Marx. That's very helpful. I just wanted to say thank you for that. And maybe what do you think about thinking about like an, like trying to understand like a history that he speculated on, but what do you think about attempts? Or would you say, don't waste your time with archaeology or history. We don't actually need to know any of these things. Or is it worth knowing? <laughs> uh, you know, like David Graeber, you know, like David Graeber's book, like that's what that project is. It's to say, oh yeah, this is what Rousseau said, but like, let's actually do this and see how far we get with it to really inquire into these origins and what might we find. And one of the things they find is, similar to what I'm saying is you get a wide, wide range. And in in, in many places, these kinds of questions about contracts and state of nature don't even happen. So I don't know, sorry, that was kind of a mess, but do you have any thoughts about the historical importance of this beyond Rousseau? Um, so I think if I understand the question, it's like what is the value of imagining through through archaeology alternatives and i mean i guess when you say through archaeology it's not it's, there's like the fact of the matter right like that that's the idea is that oh well, well i mean it yeah. does not that we would have to not history of nature like well i mean that's the thing is through archaeology one of the concept one of the conclusions of the graver's book is just like if we investigate this we actually don't find and we find like the anti-origin right it, it, which which kind of like it's not a, even in the quest of origins there's a performative deconstruction of the whole thing such that we do not find an origin a state of nature a social contract we find a plurality of ways of being yeah. and then that helps us recontextualize the entire european assumptions of political theory yeah so is the question do i think that's a useful endeavor yeah or to what degree is it useful or are there alternatives or i don't know Maybe there's not much. I think, it's, I think it's a useful and like endeavor, but and I think that Rousseau would agree <laughs> that we're constantly mistaking things as natural that are actually you know shaped by humans, whether narratively imaginatively, you know, materially, physically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so being able to fertilize our imagination in that way, um, I think it's always useful. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I wonder if he succeeded, though, in like that full pluralization. Yeah. Um, and maybe that was because he didn't have the evidence. Um, very quickly, thank you so much. I uh, also thought it was very convincing. So I have two quick questions. Um, what would you say of um, another um, image, which is the episode with the gardener in Emil, you know, the child um, being... Um, forcefully put in the situation of seeing his property or the efforts of his um you know, the, the, the efforts of his uh, his cultivation efforts being uh, and secondly um I completely take your point that maybe Rousseau's view of property could be helpful today. Um so do you have in mind any legal or any um implementations that we could do to to improve the state of poverty today in the light of Rousseau. Yeah. Small questions today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on the episode with the gardener, um, I also think this is ambiguous, like highly, because on the one hand, okay, let me just say three things. One hand, it sort of blocks narrative. <laughs> on the other hand, right before the introduction of this, and it's the first lesson that Emil gets in, in morality is a lesson about property. Right before this, so there's a long discussion of fables mm -hmm. and how children can't understand fables. And so I think there's a sort of way in which it's a fable for adults, right? And I think, you know, Emil does miss the point. <laughs> like he doesn't, he doesn't get, right, at the end of it, when he gets beans and melons and he's happy. And so there's, you know, he's, I don't think he understands it. In another way, it is 
you know, what it's sort of exposing is, um, is or maybe getting at is the sort of sense that um, private property comes with costs, that it's a costly thing. And so, um, uh, you know, the commercial society looks very, you know, good and easy, and, and that's sort of how it's sort of made to look, and um, just all being, you know, and pleasure, and and I think it's supposed to sort of make uh, the, those very gains and those very pleasures look highly costly, mm -hmm. um, because at, you know, sort of the beginning, a meal who is sort of made, you know, all of their carefully designed, is made to feel that the only thing limiting him is the naturalness of the world, or the necessary, let's say, because, you know, natural, of course, um, because because the tutor we're so is setting them up to look that way. They're not actually natural constraints. They're being set up to make that to look that way. But he feels like free to you know explore the world, and this is the first moment where he is told you can't, you know. And so on the one hand, he kind of gets the pleasure of getting to make a piece of the earth his, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, he no longer feels free to sort of just go about wherever. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, the other question is, do I have any legal ideas? Yeah. I, I think I have more critiques mm -hmm. <laughs> than, than um, so, you know, what I sort of riddle through is the problem of taxation in the paper, um, because in theory, like, so you think about a large fiscal state and that, that Rousseau has multiple models of citizenship. So, you know, the kind of intense sort of imaginative and, and identification where you become, you know, enmeshed into the community. And um, it's not possible in large commercial states. And so I think, you know, taxation is actually a form of matching social contribution uh, to gain that doesn't require you to care about other people. It's just taking, right? The state is just, you know, in fact, right? Um, so um, I think it's a second model of citizenship that he tries to sort of use to, to see, can this be solved? And I think he sort of, as the more he looks at it, the more he sort of sees how easy it is for um, one, people to escape taxation, two, for taxation itself to start making people think, oh, my property is something held against the community rather than something that is for the sake or should be for the sake of the community. And second, I think the other effect of it is that people who are taxed higher, so you do progressive taxation, people who are taxed more tend to have more interest in governance than people who are taxed less. So I think it creates perverse incentives mm -hmm. where, you know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, the anthropologists and, and archaeologists would be glad to know that they can continue their work. Uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, that was lovely. Um, um, I, I was wondering what you thought of, I, you mentioned commercial society a bit, and I, I think of Hans' book on politics and purchase life, which is not a literature I've done, to, you know, I haven't gotten a 12 volume set of the responses to his work or whatever, which I, is an actual thing, I think. Um, and, and so I just wanted you to, uh, I was going to ask though about the legal, because you didn't end with, and this could be relevant today, and I was like, how, oh, go on, that's wonderful. But, um, but, but it could be like a sort of historical question of how much are these accounts of property locked in, the home question might be, how much are they locked into the commercial society, sort of pre-industrial capitalism that Rousseau is experiencing while he's a horrible house guest with Adam Smith? Uh, Since the commercial society is the Adam Smith connection side. Um, you, you know how much are they historically specific to that, those problems? Yeah, well, so in other words, like you're, you're working out the, the, the conundrums with property and part of it is, I think, he is writing from a social construction, right? Yeah. So that's the whole problem. Like, we're missing, we're losing, leaving that out, but the whole thing is about these ideas of nature and property and everything else that are socially constructed to use the language we're not about to use anymore, right? These aren't just, uh, that is the statue of Glaucus. Try to imagine the man underneath this pretty artificial statue, et cetera, right? Uh, but here's the gardener tending to the supposedly natural fruition of, of even, even the fruit of the earth is now artificial in a, in a certain way, right? Uh, and we should, that's the only good parenting moment in the world. That's all of them, you know? Um, and so I was just wondering how much you thought it was, if he's locked into that period, does that make sense? And, and maybe, like a Marxist might come along and say, hey, it's irrelevant, he's speaking to a bygone era that can't possibly be used. You want laws for, for, for that today, right? Like you might as well ask, 
you know what leeches can do for your for your leg. I don't, I don't, I don't you know. Do you know what I mean? Like it's too it's too. That's I'm, does that answer sure. the question? You know what I mean? Or, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I think the the physical state is still very much alive. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. So, um, yeah. you know, I think that that problem that he's sort of looking at is still alive. I I do think his vision of the problem is very in that moment, and yes. I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that we could see an alternative to it or that we can. Or we can. Yeah, well, that's a problem. So, yeah. 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 But that's, I mean, that's kind of my, when I, when I sort of say, um, you know, this is an alternative to the Lockean view, what I sort of, am, you know, it, maybe the, maybe the result conclusion is there is no way to, to, to make property rights natural in the conditions that we have. Maybe maybe that is, but I think you know from his perspective that would kind of lead to the collapse of the society. I think that's right. Yeah, it's structurally non property. Yeah. yeah. Um. So it hasn't. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, we continue right to do no, I, capitalism, and so you know, if if that's what we're in, then you know maybe no, that's you know, it's, right. It's not a natural relationship. Yeah. But from within his milieu. The reason he has to, he seems contradictory is perhaps that he has to deal with the fact that property is inexorable. I mean, imagine, you know, like when we when you talk politics with people and you know, when you teach Rousseau, it's like the, the, they always ask about property for me. So I'm glad to have your paper uh, to have heard it because I have a better answer. But yeah, exactly. It's almost it feels inexorable. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. By the way, if I'm if I it, like if, if I were to say one thing that maybe it would be like sort of a service like requirement for all citizens or something like that. He talks about forced labor is better than taxation. Mm -hmm. And I and I think what what he's actually, you know, sort of responding to is the actual existence of forced labor that only like required peasants at the time. Mm -hmm. Um and he says it should be the rich people, actually, the most sort of honored and val you know valued members of society, you know, that are actually doing forced labor. Um I'm but, sorry, especially if they don't have to do anthropology like yeah. you know really sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That was great. Thanks. I have a bit. Of, so I'm not a Rousseauian, uh, and um, you know I read Locke long ago. So probably I'm, you know just this question is about my confusion rather than you know. Uh, but so you, you mentioned this idea is Rousseau closer to Locke or Marx, and th that also made me think of your one of your questions in the discussion about uh, state of nature being an ideology when you extract the normative sort of features from it. But I was thinking. Um, you know, and also your classification of bourgeois, and of course, you know, like I'm on board with that and I, I'm sympathetic to that, but that makes me think of another question of how much of this bourgeois sort of philosophy is present in Marx himself, right? And how analogous to a philosophy of the state of nature, we actually find uh, a philosophy that is analogous to that in the early, in the early Marx, for example, right? So the idea of the human essence that is expressed through the Stetigkeit and then, you know, um, alienation comes from the fact that we cannot appropriate our essence that's materialized and expressed in the things we produce. So um, that made me think, of course, we usually frame this via Hegel, right? Mm. But, and again, this is not a very rigorous comment, but, um, you know, Locke has also something to say about this mm. because he speaks of property as my, as far as I remember, um, my ownership of my body and the product of the activity of my body. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't that art? Strangely <laughs> similar. Yeah. Right. Like so, yeah. And and maybe in that connection, that kind of intermediate state of state of nature that you find in Rousseau can be actually either very close to Marx, but also in a way, without the normative anti-accumulation uh, feature that you highlighted. But also somehow connected to this Lockean idea. Yeah. I don't know, just throwing this out there. No, you're okay. totally spot on. I think, you know, I think it's a mistake to sort of, I don't know, hold up Marx as like anti bourgeois, and, you know, anti capitalist in the sort of like total sense of we need to get totally out of that like imaginary and just like reject it and deep, you know, falsify it or whatever. He's working within it. Mm -hmm. He's using the tools of bourgeois political economy and bourgeois political thought against it. Yeah. And a lot of the assumptions are the same, it's, you know. So it's a tool, and I think, you know, for so too, you know, the the, the net, there's a, a a danger of naturalization. I think it is bourgeois. I think it can end up back in Locke, and not that very different from Locke. But 
you have to pay attention to how he's borrowing stories right. and manipulating them. I, I've just got a quick comment. You, you may or may not choose to reply. I, I can't frame it as a question, so you we might just choose to leave it there or not, but I, I'll, I'll leave that to you. I was really fascinated, and it's the first time that I'd um, been presented with thinking along those lines when you were talking about the natural and the artificial and the way in which they're so imbricated mm -hmm. in Rousseau. And it put me in mind of the, the opening of, of the Leviathan, like the, the first words of chapter one, nature, brackets, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, close bracket, is by the art of man, as in so many other things, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so nature and art, right from the get-go, they're completely tied up with each other. Oh, um, and so what you were saying, put Rousseau, because I'd, I'd had Rousseau up until now in a very different ballpark yeah. to that. But now I think, oh my goodness, I need to reassess the way that I relate Rousseau. So, so, so I thought Hobbes was the only one of the social contract theorists that was doing this, but now I'm having to think again. Yeah. Um, and do, do, perhaps the... The, the question coming out of that would be, do you have any re reflections upon the the significance of this weaving together, this inextricability of, of nature and artifice in Rousseau, in the broader context of, of these other thinkers who seem to have done similar things? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, so first I'll say that I think Rousseau's a, a great reader of Montaigne. I mean, Montaigne is you know, the center of his insight. And, you know, I think anyone, you know, he uses of cannibals for, for, you know, then on the one hand, you get the noble savage. On the other hand, the noble savage is highly, like, great. The the language that the uh, Tupanamba people speak who are discussed in that essay is described as altogether anachronic, which is like a, a form of Greek meter, right? So, um, and so it's like the highest, like, French literary form at the time, right? So it's not, Right, being contrasted to this is non-civilization. It is civilization. So I think, and I think he's aware of that. I do think Hobbes goes further than anyone in the like. I don't even. I don't think that there is nature at all in Hobbes. It's it's all a creation of language. Like, yeah. not the reverse. It's material from all the way down. Material, right. but materialism in what sense? It's a very different materialism than Marxist materialism. Yeah. That's a whole other question. I'll leave, that to, I'll leave that to Thomas and his, his, his history of materials and his is in volume 20 at this point. Uh, no, I mean, even when he's discussing language in part one of the Leviathan, he describes it as uh, the result of sensations in the mind. Um, the mind itself is like, he, he's a materialist. Like, that's not, that's not, right? And so when he's talking to nature, the total implication is actually the reduction of the cultural to the nature. That's the whole problem of Hobbes, and that's why the social contract has to be a result of the powers and the results of our appetites and so on in a state of nature. But if Chris wants to hold on to his figures, he needs that bifurcation because you have the homogenization and the bifurcation that you have in Rousseau. Hobbes is, is, is an interesting character because he does have the bifurcation, but on the other hand, it, it arises out of our nature rather than with Rousseau, it is kind of a second nature. This is the problem with people one, people two thing. Does that make sense? You know? Oh, does that make sense? Um, I don't know. Like, like, I mean, I don't see like it. Hobbes is not saying like because we speak it, it's it's conventional. And therefore, this is what we mean by it is conventional. But, but he says language is invented. It's yes. not natural. Not in that sense, but but he talks about he gives an origin of languages and it's a very materialistic one, not um with conceptual schemes and we can't think outside conceptual schemes. He's giving a very natural, for his time, geometric, but naturalistic account of the rival language psychological states. These are brain states, really, what we call today, right? Like, that's, there is no nature and culture divide. That's, that's what I meant. But not like... I think there is no nature, to be honest. In oh, I guess then that means there's no culture. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's only... Culture, okay. <laughs> There's also, and we, we do need to wrap up, there's also perhaps two senses of the natural. Yeah, I think that's what we're doing. Being thrown around in this conversation as well. We need to disambiguate those. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's determinism, which I think he does believe in, mm -hmm. but I don't think he believes that we have any access to purity. I mean, there's the world, and then there's then there's us. And yeah, we're talking about the world of yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wonderful. That's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.